doctor in the TARDIS. Next stop everywhere. Stop everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in the TARDIS for a very special episode as I'm joined by, once again, my partner in time, fresh out of the hospital, looking as fresh as a daisy, Jesse Jackson. How you doing, Jesse? I'm good. So, hey, what's up with you, Charles? Anything new going on? <laughs> <laughs> not much, not much. No big deal. How you feeling, man? I am feeling good. It has been a um, a rough four to six weeks, but overall, I'm doing well. Uh, I'm. Uh, this has been. I'm about on eighth, my eighth day past surgery. Congratulations! And uh, yes, I'm. I'm still on liquid only food, but um, I'm getting more energy uh, every day. And things are going well. So, yeah, it's things are great. And I am so excited to be talking to you, not just because I've missed you and our listeners, uh, right. though, I'm, though I've become a listener now and listening. But um, we are – this is a special occasion. Yes, it is. In so many ways. Yes, it is. So without any further ado, let me introduce someone who – I've been spending the past seven years trying to get on this podcast. Someone very near and dear to both Jesse and my heart, especially mine, because everyone, I want to introduce my wonderful wife, my beautiful wife, Lori Skaggs. How are you doing, Lori? I'm just fine, and I think you have this, uh, you were laying it on a tad bit thick. No, 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 no. Not, no, not thick no, enough. No. Not thick enough, right, Jesse? No. <laughs> No, I cannot. I am so thrilled, uh, and and it was it was funny because Charles and I have been in constant communication, uh, and I know he's talked about updates, but you know, a, two or three days don't go by without Charles sending me a DM or a text going, "Hey, man, how you doing? Anything I, you need? What right. what can we do?" Um, and I said, "Look, um, when are we supposed to meet with Lori?" And he said, "Well." Um, it's the first week of June, and I'm like, okay, well, June 2nd's my wedding anniversary. June 3rd's my birthday. Um, can so we ha- do June So happy 1st? anniversary and happy birthday in advance. Thank you. Yes, happy yeah, anniversary we, and happy birthday. Yeah, Charles and I have a rule because we are uh, we are well um, – we are good husbands. No podcasting on anniversary days, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And, and so uh, – and I, I said, I just, I can't miss having Lori on the show, not only because it's a great episode, but, um, you know, you, Lori, and I, I, I can't <laughs> even count how many years. You get, probably we get, can. Well, you know, I, w- I would say we've, you know, probably got to know one another since back, what, 93? Yeah. And so it's been a, a while. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. it's only been about mm, let's say twenty eight years. Because <laughs> given as that, you guys have, as you guys have talked about, it, and we go, we we went more into this in in Titan Talk, the Titans podcast. Mm-hmm. Look for it where all fine podcasts are uh, served. That Charles and I met because of an uh, it wasn't an online app, but it was a physical uh, amateur press association, and uh, that was dedicated to the New Teen Titans and. Mm-hmm. Um, Lori was part of that group, and we became friends, and we became, you know, uh, she and I exchanged letters back then, and we we just enjoy, we became Phone friends. Calls. Yeah, and you and I were friends. 
And Charles should realize that he probably owes the ability for, to say that we got married in a lot of part because of Sir Jesse Jackson, who, though you are not that much older than me, I still consider you a, my dad figure because you've got one of those old souls. So there were many times that we had conversations where I was like, I'm done, I'm gone. I'm going away. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure. Jesse would say, no, listen to your heart. Yes. Um, and figure out what's right and stand by what you want to do and you'll get it. And lo and behold, there it happened. It, and yeah. that's why you had to walk me down the aisle because there was nobody else that would have been able to have done that. <laughs> and it, it truly was. And um, listeners, a highlight of my life when Lori reached out to me and said, Charles and I have talked about it and there is no one more, no one I would want more than to come up here to Ohio and walk me down the aisle. And um, would you be willing to do it? And, you know, I talked to Linda and I said, you know, this is one of the nicest compliments I've ever received. And so we did. We we flew up. I flew up to Ohio. I was treated like a returning prince by all of you (laughs) and your friends. And then we had the best wedding and the great reception. And then, you know, we, we had a great you guys were off on your honeymoon and you're doing it. And we were there at your condo and just having a great thing, it just a kind of a Titans reunion and all this stuff. And it truly is. And, and we've continued to be not only online friends, but, you know, Lori's, Lori's had to come to Dallas for a business meeting and we went and spent like a hundred dollars on sushi. Linda, Lori oh my and gosh. I, it and was so good. would let me pay for any of it. Yes. Do tell. What, else, what other shenanigans were you guys up to? <laughs> no, I didn't, yes. I didn't get the, I didn't, it's funny. I never got these stories. Yes. yes and then, did. and then, you know, Charles and I would invite me, Charles, up to, for mid Ohio con. Mm-hmm. And then when you know, like, when we we're going through to vacation, we stopped your so, bourbon tours and yeah. Anytime. Yep. So we have continued to see each other. And then, you know, and then seven years ago, we once a week said, Hey, let's talk Dr. Who. And <laughs> so that's just made it, it even better. And so this is so special to be able to have uh, my daughter on the podcast with me. Yes. Well, in honor of Memorial Day, and because we're doing this little bit of Titan Fest thing, I think you should also think about how many people who were at my wedding or our wedding that are no longer with us. That, that, Leah Adizio, um, yes. Sherry, and yep. Lindy Whitmore. Yep. That is sad. And I, I do every once in a while think of, Leah, and especially when I see something on TV, mm-hmm. and I go, I just would love to be able to pick a phone and call her and go, hey, what'd you think? What'd you think? So, yeah. yeah, we, I think that's a lot about Lindy, too. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's been tough. She was, I, you guys both have her to thank for me still being alive, I think, from grade school time frame, because had it not been for her, there would I wouldn't have been the person I am today, literally. So. All right. So... Um, All right, enough down memory lane. Well, you know, we had an episode. We, had an episode to we talk do about, have an episode, right? to do, but uh, but I know a lot of our, our listeners have been um, they've been worried about you, Jesse. You know, obviously you've been in the hospital, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But it, but I, I didn't know if there was anything you'd like to to share with everybody. Um, you know, uh, that's reached out to you during the recovery, sure. or just you know any of your experiences. And give everybody yes. kind of a, a first-hand update of, yes. of what's going on with you. So uh, it started a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. actually longer than that. And it's um, – <laughs> Charles has, um, much to his probably horror, recorded evidence of how sick I was <laughs> as we were trying to record an episode of this podcast. Um, I turned out I had a five-centimeter mass in my stomach. Uh, they determined that, uh, it needed to come out. Um, I had to get approval from my health insurance to, uh, for payment, of course. Uh, the, uh, the procedure to cure this is basically, 
um, they have to go into your stomach, take out part of your stomach. Well, when you take out part of your stomach, your what's left, the little stomach pouch and the intestine can't stretch to meet each other. Right. So you have to do gastric bypass. And uh, as the doctor said, this is what I normally do with someone who is going through gastric bypass surgery to lose weight. So um, I might be able to kill two birds with one stone here. I can not only get rid of your tumor, um, and then also I can set you on a course to have a a more healthy life because you will be losing weight. So um, I – um, so I had to spend a two week. Once I got approved, I spent two weeks in a, a special diet to shrink your liver. Right. And then, uh, then uh, surgery went on Monday, um, the twenty fourth. Um, we talked a little bit before recording, and Charles felt my pain. Yes, I do. Years ago, he had torso stomach. Um, it's a really painful stomach. It is. It's a painful, but the recovery is going well. I am. Um, I will um, – Now, do you have, have stomach a, staples? I'm sorry to interrupt, but – No, no, no. No I, stomach staples? I do have stomach staples, about 12. Okay. Even though – and then I have some others that are just glued. So okay. most of what they were able to do was through liposcopic, but there is enough. So there is this, you know, I now have I, – I have pulling. the scar from the – I have the scar from the colon cancer – I have the scar from when they gave me the port last time I had cancer. Now I've got this others. So Linda's like, if you're ever hurt and they're like, well, his head's not here. And I can look <laughs> at the stomach and go there, you know, which tells you she watches way too much Discovery Scary TV to think about that. You know? Oh, just like my wife. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, I I should be able um, – they the my – the doctor says it takes four to six weeks to recover, um, so I, I can go back to work probably as soon as June 21st. Probably G- July 12th will be the latest. Uh, my my work has been absolutely amazing and supportive, and uh, the they've said you know take whatever you need. What's been able to do uh, all the time going up to the surgery that we work from home. Uh, but, um, they let me, you know, whenever I was tired. So, uh, it's been amazing. Uh, a couple of fans of this podcast and, and set Lessing Bruce reached out to me and said, Hey, we want to help. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know if I feel right doing a GoFundMe because I did one when I had colon cancer and, right. and they said, that's, that's not you to worry about, Jesse, set it up. And if people want to give just accept it. And so uh, we set up a GoFundMe and people have been very generous. So uh, finan- financially, because of the, sh- the our short-term disability pays very little, uh, we will be fine financially. Uh, so that is good that I don't have that added stress worrying about. I can just worry about healing. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I, I will. I may join you at times, Charles, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But I may just need to join you and to talk about an episode and spend about ten minutes complaining how I miss real food. Uh, you know, <laughs> because um, August twenty fifth is the between now and August twenty fifth, I can't have anything as a normal diet. I'm either on a liquid or on a soft food. So wow. um, I did buy. Uh, Texas Ranger baseball tickets for like the Saturday, the 29th, August 29th, like three or four days after. I'm I'm like, I probably will only be able to eat like a quarter of a hot dog bun with no bun. But by God, I'll be at the ballpark. Good for you. I'll be sipping (laughs) water and, you know, watching baseball. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Well, you know, obviously, you know, we've had a lot of people worried about you. A lot of people keeping you in their thoughts. And, uh, you know, everybody's been asking about you. So, so it's, yeah. it's very special that you're here and I'm very appreciative. Yes. And, and Lori, I know that, um, you know, like I said, I mean, you know, it's been a while since we've been trying to get you to say, Hey, uh, you want to talk some Dr. Who with us? It'd be a lot of fun. And, you know, it's just only recently, I, I think that you've been feeling comfortable enough to do that. Right. Yeah, well, I think a lot of that has to do with the whole work from homes kind of thing where we are doing a whole lot of these whole um, 
conference calls for work and stuff at home and so I don't feel quite as weird as being on a camera and a, and a microphone. So <laughs> well, you know, it's it's just Jesse and me, and we're just recording yes. this, so it's no big deal. Right. So and the rest of the people who will be listening later on. So you know, <laughs> don't worry a couple about, of dozen. Don't, don't worry about, about them. Don't worry about them. You know, maybe maybe a few hundred, but that's okay. Yeah. But so I ask this question of everybody that comes on this podcast. So I have to know. I mean, I kind of already know the answer, but for those out there that don't know, all of us, all of our listeners in podcast land, so what was it that got you into Doctor Who? And then obviously you've heard me go on and on and on and on and on about it over the years, but what finally got you to watch some Doctor Who? Well, way back when we were pretending to just be friends. I slept through many, many of the um, original Doctor Who uh, episodes while you would put them on and I'd suddenly fall asleep for some strange reason. Um, But then there was a a special that came on with, was that the eighth Doctor? Yeah, Paul McGann, the 1996 TV movie, while I was recovering from my surgeries. Right. Right. And yeah, so, and I realized then what was coming into the modern time, I have a hard time with some of the earlier stuff just because it just doesn't look real. <laughs> right. Um, but that was the first, Paul McGann was the first doctor. I was like, oh, I think I could get into this. And then Eccleston came along and that was fantastic. I mean, there's many, no many pun episodes. Intended. No pun intended, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but there was many episodes of his that really got me. And then there was this little guy named David Tennant, who, who? has this interesting, yeah, Scottish accent and uh, was a little deranged and a little cute. No, a lot cute. <laughs> and just seemed to really capture my heart. So the Tenth Doctor will always be my doctor. And the episode we're going to be talking about is my absolute most favorite episode of all the Doctor Who's that I've seen up to this point. Um, and it's the one that really made it concrete to me that, that David Tennant would be always my doctor. Well, that's a perfect segue because here at episode 234, we are going to be discussing the girl in the fireplace. And as Lori said, I know this is her all-time favorite Doctor Who episode. How many times have I watched it now? I don't know. How many times have you watched it? You want to know? I would like to know, yes. I believe it's up to 31 times. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) So, So, obviously, this is Lori's favorite. And this is the one, give a little background to everybody. Since, I, you know, like I said, I've been trying to get her for years to get on this podcast, but she told me all those years, she would say, if I ever did the podcast, if I ever came on Next Stop Everywhere, this would be the story I would want to talk about. So consequently, everybody else that has requested this over the years, I have rebuffed them. I have said, no. Uh, I'm saving that for a very special someone, not even, you know, with the guarantee that you would actually do this. So yes. years would go by. Everybody's like, when are you going to do the girl in the fireplace? Well, you got to have to wait. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it for somebody I, you know, very special. So years would go by, years would go by. And then finally, thanks to COVID. So hooray COVID yes. for, uh, you know, getting war at Lori, working from home and feeling comfortable enough that she said, okay, I guess if we want to do this, we could go maybe do the podcast and discuss Girl in the Fireplace, if we have to. <laughs> Ringing endorsement, right? <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> well, hopefully something is a podcast, but... <laughs> Yeah. All right. So I, 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 I'll take Lori off the hot seat, but I did. I did have to share that story because it's uh, that is a great this is story. this is one that's obviously been a long time coming. All right. Absolutely. So with so with that in mind, let's talk some girl in the fireplace, everybody. 
Good deal. This was the fourth episode from Series 2 back in 2006, written by Stephen Moffat. Maybe you've heard of that guy. <laughs> directed by Euros Lin, who directed such notable episodes as The End of the World, The Unquiet Dead, The Runaway Bride, Silence in the Library, Forest of the Dead, which is one we still have to talk about here on this podcast. Yes, yes. And David Tennant's final story, The End of Time, among others. And, of course, this one stars David Tennant as the Tenth Doctor, Billy Piper as Rose Tyler, and Noel Clark as Mickey Smith. So, um, before we get in and get into cast or, or trivia or whatnot... Jesse, I'm I'm guessing you have some general thoughts you'd like to share about this story before we start diving deep into it. Yeah, I remember in the initial, my initial, when I was binging The Doctor, Mm -hmm. you know, I I really like this one. And and there's going to be specific things we'll talk about as we break it down. Um, But I've always, you know, liked it and and enjoyed it. you know, a wonderful guest actress that I think you're going to talk about in a few minutes. That's really strong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So yesterday um, I, you know, I pulled up HBO go and I, I pulled up the episode and started watching it and I ended up tweeting. It's just a little ray of happiness. (laughs) You know, it is just a wonderful, just episode um, filled with, so many wonderful lines, so much, you know, timey wiminess, um, a wonderful chemistry between uh, our guest star and David Tennant. It, it, I certainly love the first two, the Eccleston episodes that Moffat wrote. Those are, I, I think, in a lot the, of ways. The, um, the yeah. Empty Child and uh, – yeah. The Doctor yeah. Dances, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I certainly can make the argument that those are two early modern Who classics. Yeah. But in a lot of ways, this feels like the, oh, Doctor Who can do things a little differently. You know, I can just imagine someone like myself who'd never watched any classic Who mm-hmm. went, wait a minute, they can do that? And it was just really, really well done. So uh, I, I was ecstatic watching it yesterday and, uh, you know, made some notes, and I'm just looking forward to sharing. All right. So well, that's a good – this is a great episode to keep your spirits up, right? Yes, it is. It truly is. And, Lori, how about you? What, what was your – you know, before we get into our little deep dive, what are your, what are your general <laughs> reactions to the, to this story that you love so much? I think what really drew me into it was that you could see the doctor as still being his, his alien self, but he really also encompasses that human side of us, that, that one that needs to help, needs to love, needs to be loved. Um, I think that Madame de Pompadour helps him pull that out when we start talking about some of the things that they're, they do, but um, I just thought that the the um, dressing of the sets was amazing, and the costuming was amazing. And by the way, for anybody who is one of those people who is into the seeing how close to um, the 17th century they actually were, the dresses and the the yeah. um, study the the um, set was actually very authentic to the time frame. Um, They pulled some of Sophia Miles' dresses from different um, sets or different other different movies uh, that were in that time frame. So they have been around Was it one of those from like a Helen Mirren movie? Um, Yes. And that was the one that um, in the the Versailles, um, when... The doctor comes in the, ball, in the, the, in the ballroom. In the yeah. ballroom, yep. Yeah, yeah. However, so. there's a not, there is a connection with one of Sophia's um, dresses to another episode of Doctor Who, and it's from the Fifth Doctor. Yes. It is the Black Orchid. Mm-hmm. And it's the dress that she was wearing when she was walking in the 
on the lawn with her um, other friend while the doctor is watching them from behind scenes. Interesting. Well, it's a very interesting that you mentioned that particular episode. I'm going to save that for the end of the show to tell you ah, why. Ah, now that's there. a tease. Yeah. That's, well, you know, that's, that's my specialty in trade, that, right? That dress also appeared in um, The Madness of King George and The Aristocrats, too. So it's it's actually been around. And in some of those, the dress itself looks different colors depending on the lighting. And the lighting that they used for Versailles or for here, yeah. um, it looks more gold. And in other places, it can look more silver. So it's very interesting how they do what they do with lighting to make it look a little different. So you don't necessarily connect it to other films. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. All right. So... So speaking of the cast, let's uh, let's run this down. There's not a lot of guest cast in this one, but Sophia Miles, obviously, we we have to start with her uh, because she plays Renette, which of course stands for Little Queen. It's a nickname, mm-hmm. and uh, AKA Jean Antoinette Poisson, AKA Madame de Pompadour. Now, she actually does a little bit uh, she actually came back years later recently during the lockdowns in the UK for when they were doing their Doctor Who lockdown type little webisodes and she did a short story written by Stephen Moffat which is sort of a sequel to this episode it's called Pompadour Mm. and what she did she played the voice of the ship the SS Madame de Pompadour in that. So if you've ever, if you haven't listened to that, I really recommend doing so, but you need to do that with like a giant box of tissues because okay. it's Stephen Moffat and he will rip your heart right out of your chest and then throw it on the floor and then uh, for everybody to see. So just a fair warning. It's a, it's a bit of a tearjerker, needless to say, but, but it was very cool that Sophia Miles was willing to reprise that sort of you know she was originally madame de pompadour in the in the girl in fireplace but then she got to be the ss madame de pompadour the ship the voice of the ship in that story pompadour she also was in a big finish audio from the that featured the fourth doctor tom baker where she played a character named rania chuma in a two-parter called kill the doctor and the age of sutek which was a sequel to Pyramid of, Pyramids of Mars from Tom Baker's era. Huh? She was also in the movie From Hell. And if you're an Underworld fan, you recognize her as the character Erica in the original Underworld movie and Underworld Evolution. She's in those. She was also in the movie Transformers Age of Extinction. And Lori and I kind of know her. This is probably something Lori hasn't thought about for a long time. The TV series Moonlight. You know, where she was partnered with a vampire. She was a detective, kind of like Lucifer. You know, she's a detective, and the the, the guy she was partnered with was a vampire. That show? Yeah, the that was the male CBS. lead that, that ended up being on uh, the remake of Hawaii Five-0, right? But they really wanted yeah. to be him, and uh, yeah. it was um, – yeah, yeah, this it, is the show he did first before Hawaii yeah, Five O, the revamped yeah. Hawaii Five O. Yeah, yeah, uh, really, really. Um, I remember that, and I'd forgotten she was the female lead. Yeah, she um, is. You know, once again, it that's a that's kind of a trope that you use, right? Yeah. But I remember the show being actually pretty interesting. Yeah, it was. It was. A, it only lasted like I think seventeen episodes. It even lasted a full season, but yeah. But uh, we enjoyed it while it lasted. I agree. And we also had Ben Turner, who plays King Louis the Fifteenth, and he's notable because he was in the sequel to Three Hundred, Three Hundred: Rise of an Empire. If you're at all curious, so trivia: this is the first appearance of the Clockwork Droids, who of course return years later in 2014 in Peter Capaldi's first story, Deep Breath. You know, where we got the, the half-faced man, remember that? Which yes. was, remember, Jesse, that was our first Next Stop Everywhere review, Deep Breath. I did, 
It was. Yes, it was. Exactly. See how, see how it brings everything full it's circle? All together, it's, yes. It's all connected, right? Now, in 2004, executive producer Russell T. Davies was responsible for an, another show before he did Doctor Who called Casanova, which starred a certain David Tennant, which was a serial set in the 18th century. And during his research for that show, Russell T. Davies became fascinated with Madame de Pompadour and wanted to include her in a story that also involved the Turk, which was this clockwork man who, you know, played chess, like, like it was an automated automaton that was, uh, you know, that it was actually from that same time period and was later revealed to be a hoax. True story. But in 2005, Stephen Moffat was res- assigned to write the story. So Russell T. Davies came up with the idea and then gave it to Stephen Moffat to write the actual story for, which, of course, he did brilliantly. Yes. This st- episode is only one of the only one of series two to have no reference to Torchwood. Remember in, in series two, they you right. know like kind of like the, the when they did the Bad Wolf in series one, that would pop up everywhere you know once at least once in an episode. Well, they were doing the same thing with Torchwood in series two, but th- not this episode because Stephen Moffat thought that um, the theme of the season wouldn't exactly fit with what was going on here. And I think that was a good call. I think so too. Otherwise, oh, it would seem. Yeah, I thought it would have seemed really forced, right? Now, here's a little bit of it from the scandal sheets. Sophia Miles and David Tennant started dating after working together on this story. It was rumored she actually carried a Doctor Who doll, maybe an action figure, I don't know, in her handbag. <laughs> oh, how fun! But how of course, but of course, their relationship ended in 2007. And a year later, Tennant decided, well, I'm going to start dating Peter Davison's daughter, Georgia Moffat, after they worked together on The Doctor's Daughter. And, of course, they eventually married and had a ton of kids. Yes, they have. So David Tennant obviously has a type. (laughs) They are similar and also, like many of us. Blood uh, and so, working on Doctor Who, apparently. <laughs> see, uh, people you meet at your workplace, right? Workplace uh, <laughs> romances are not necessarily dead. <laughs> yeah. Now, Arthur the Horse, and I'm sure being Lori, being an animal person, would appreciate this little factoid, yes. was not allowed to set foot in the ballroom where they filmed during the climactic scene. <laughs> the various elements of the Doctor riding Arthur through the mirror, you know, including the the, the horse... The mirror breaking, the reactions of the extras, those all had to be filmed at separate times. And then they composited those together for that. Oh, and that's sequence. because that ballroom was at was on was in a very famous historical building. So of course they didn't want hoof prints all over their ballroom in their fancy house, country yes. house. Go figure. <laughs> now you think they could at least put down a carpet, right? And just not shoot the floor, but yeah, I mean, they, I don't know. you know, you have rodeos and, you know, the Astrodome and, you know, other stadiums. So you would think you could do this, but yes. I'm sure they were worried just about that. that the horse would poop all over the floor, I'm guessing. Yes, and tear it up, yes. Actually, it'd be more the, because of the hooves. Because, yeah, yeah the scratching and the, of the and floor. The, yeah, yeah, the, yep. And the horseshoes, yep, scratching yep. the floor. Yep. Now, lastly, in the original script, it was that mind meld with the doctor that initially attracted the clockwork droids to Raynette. And Rose then offers Madame de Pompadour a gem that would erase all the signs of contact from the, uh, with the doctor from her mind. But of course she, she would refuse because she doesn't want to forget him. That's in the original version of the script. Also, the script originally contained out-of-order meetings between the doctor and Renette, in which she recalls him at seeing him at her convent school, which he later visits. And there was also a deleted scene where the doctor met the cruel owner of Arthur, the horse, who was trying to find the horse and then threatening to hurt it when he found the horse. So probably a good thing as far as Lori's, I'm, I'm betting, is concerned that they decided to cut that part out, right? Yeah. 
probably better for the cruel owner that they that doc, the doctor didn't come in contact with him. Yes. Right. You know, he might could, have been lost in spite of the uh, TARDIS never to be found in all of those infinite rooms. Or into a black, dropped into a black hole or something, right? Right. Yeah. 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 All right. So, Lori, do you have any historical trivia regarding Madame de Pompadour you'd like to share with the class? Oh, yes. Let's see. What to cut? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, there is a possibility that... Francois Poisson was not Madame de Pompadour's actual father. Um, yes, I, her mother seemed to get around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and when he was run out of France because of having debts, <laughs> he was very deeply in debt, um, a, um, a gentleman came in and became her guardian who could probably have been or most likely had been her, her father, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, Ren Renette was actually, she was not called that at the age of seven, which is where the doctor first calls her that. Yeah. She was, it was, she was nine when that was, when she was first called that after her mother took her to a fortune teller who said that basically she would be a queen and all these and I'm not sure if that is fact or fiction that's been built into even legend, her um, kind of like legend. Yeah, legend. legend. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's even in the biographies, which, by the way, I ended up getting a biography on her because of Doctor Who. Um, she did go to a convent school. She was very well educated, but she only stayed there for about four years because she ended up with a very bad case of whooping cough that almost killed her. Oh. And so she came back home, mm. and that is when her um, her uh, new guardian, Le Normand de Tournen, um, became her legal guardian, and then he hired these expensive tutors for her so that she would have the best education possible. And that is when she, his, her mother and he started grooming her to be a courtesan in Paris. Um, however, between then, between, before she met the king, he actually married her to his nephew. So she was actually married when she met the king. Uh, she was 19 when she, uh, she was married. Um, he completely fell in love with her, her little husband did. But she had set her sights on doing the king. And she actually was known to have said that she would never leave her husband except for the king. Interesting. Um, so yes. she cheated on her husband with a king, King Louis the f 15th. Well, she sort of cheated on her husband with King Louis. Um, <laughs> How do you sort of cheat? <laughs> asking for a friend. It was no. <laughs> a blessing of her guardian and her mother because they all wanted all of the goodness that comes from um, having a mistress in the family, a mistress of the king in the family. And she first met King Louis uh, when he was at a hunt at her estate, her and her husband's estate. And she went, um, he was hunting, and she kept going in front of him. And every time she, he would see her, she was in a different outfit. So she would get on her horse, hop in front of him in one color of an outfit, and then later on, she'd be in front of him again in another outfit. How she arranged all of those maids to help her in and out of all those gowns at that right. point in time, I don't even want to try and figure out how that happened. But it was several times. It was like four or five times that she did that. Um, and when she did finally meet him and become his mistress, it was at a mask, and I believe they said that in the, in the Girl in the Fireplace, she was dressed as Diana, goddess of the hunt. Oh. And Yes. And the king kind of to remind him of what she had, where he had first seen her. The king and some of his gentlemen were all dressed as yew trees so that nobody would know who the king was until he saw her. And then he threw off his gear, his, his costume and, and revealed himself. That, that yeah. re, he revealed himself and proclaimed his devotion to um, Madame de Pompadour. Interesting. So, and at that point, she was not Madame de Pompadour. 
he actually, because she was of the middle class, she was a merchant class person, so she had no nobility, no nobility in her. Um, he gave her her papers patent and made her the Marquise of Pompadour, Marquise de Pompadour. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that's how come she was able to be no, as she was um, ennobled through that. Um, the people hated her. The, the general people in the country absolutely hated her. She was beloved by the queen. Uh, she did quite a few interesting little things to become um, in a, with the queen. She yeah, that actually gets king. mentioned in the story, by the way, that the queen liked her. Yeah, yeah that it yeah. seemed like yeah. that was, you know, and he makes the joke, right, it's French. Right, but the, <laughs> the relationship worked between the three of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But there was reasons for this. So some of the reasons were that she forced the king to pay the queen's gambling debts mm -hmm. that the, the king was not wanting to pay. She also talked him into renovating the queen's apartments and bringing them up to date. Mm -hmm. And then she gave the uh, queen a little gold snuff box that the king had actually given her. So that might be the first tie, uh, time that re-gifting was created. <laughs> And very nice. <laughs> right. Those, those are a few things. Her death, she did die of tuberculosis. Okay. That was why. That was what happened. And she had. Uh, there was a little um, chateau that she was having built for her and the king. Um, it was not completed when she died, but shortly thereafter, it was completed, and he put his new mistress into that chateau. So mm. she was not his last mistress. No. Of course, we all know she was building it for her and the doctor, right? Yes, indeed. Of course, of yeah. course, of course. All right. So, um, thank you, Lori. That was great. Yeah, that was because, fantastic. You know, fantastic I, job, Lori. By the way. Yeah, because <laughs> you know, as you're, as I'm watching this, you're going, "Well, I've never heard of this person," but um, you do very little search, and it find out this is pretty a. A pretty famous uh, person in this historical context. She yeah. was a prime minister for all intents and purposes. A lot of the people, uh, a lot of the um, um, foreigners would come to her with things that they wanted to get in front of the king. Um, so yeah, it was. It's pretty interesting, if you, especially if you think about that time frame and how little women had. Uh, yeah. influence and power. I mean, there's a few notables in that time, you know, before her, there Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots and a few others, but there's not a lot of women who really have that kind of power. And she, coming from literally almost nothing, cut right, raises to basically a prime minister position when there was no position like that for women at that time. Interesting. And, and she's very smart. Yeah. Very smart. Well, you'd almost have to be to pull that off, I'm guessing. Yeah. Right, which is why I think she makes such a good companion for the doctor. Yeah. Well, yes. he's, that's one of the so things I, that we'll talk about is that uh, Madame de Pompadour, you, you know, that's it's probably one of the things that attracts the doctor to her, right? Is her right. her intelligence and the, the fact that, you know, they're able to connect when they do that kind of mind meld, telepathic mind meld yes. thing. All right. So um, three topics today. Topic number one, let's start right off the bat with the Lonely Angel. And so we're going to talk the 10th Doctor and Madame de Pompadour, which is obviously the main focus of this story. As the Doctor takes um, Rose and new companion, Mickey, who is officially a companion now, to the 51st century. And they arrive on this abandoned spaceship, the SS Madame de Pompadour. But of course, they don't know what it's called. At this point, we find out, find that out at the very end of the episode. And in the process, they, you know, they find that there are these portals that are somehow connected through a fireplace to 18th century France. And it's there, you know, when the doctor, while exploring this, you know, checking out this fireplace, first meets Raynette as a child. and. So he goes through the fireplace, it's, it revolves around, and from there, um, they kind of start developing this relationship over time, because at first he meets her as a child, and then later on, they, you know, she grows to adulthood, 
and then it becomes a full blown romance. As the, and as the doctor likes to say, you know, like, you know, I just snog Madame de Pompadour. Yes. So, um, so I'm curious about everybody's, you know, reactions to this. So, Lori, why don't we start with you first on this one? What did you make of the Tenth Doctor and Madame de Pompadour in this story? I thought they laid it out very, very well, and I thought what I thought it might be creepy seeing him like go after somebody he met first as a child, but the way that they switch it around, it's it, it isn't creepy at all, right? He meets this young girl and he's very protective of her, right? And then the next time that the fireplace flips, you know, it's. Uh, this young lady of probably around 19 is what her age would have been when he first met her right. as an, uh, more as an adult. And um, the instant connection, I mean, there's something about Tennant. He works with his, his facial expressions and his eyes and the way that he can pr- give you all the sense of emotion just by a look. And there's not too many actors out there that can do that. And I love Sophia Miles and her little coy expressions and her little half half smiles and the way that she kind of little squints her eyes. It's perfect. I mean, she truly, flirt, honestly, she the flirts court with is her on. She flirts with her eyes. Yes. And the smirks, those little smirks. Just watch those little smirks. Little, little yes. mischievous smirks. Yes. Yeah. 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 I thought it was beautifully done. I mean, it, it's hard to get that kind of a connection in an hour episode and it would have been even less for the doctor because I mean, he was taking little snippets of like half hours, maybe, you know, throughout this, but yet he falls head over heels in love with her so quickly. And I just thought it was beautiful. Yeah. How about you, Jesse? What are you, what are your thoughts about the, this relationship, this pairing of the doctor, you know, falling in love for at least briefly, Maybe. briefly with Madame de Pompadour. It is not surprising that you find out these two ended up dating in real life because there was an on-screen chemistry. Um, The first thing I think of as I was watching this is going, um, wow, this is – he – he – he ain't he he was she was the girl who waited before the girl who waited, right? right. Like this is the – you know – This is the Amy Pond before Amy Pond. Yes, and – so do you think Moffat um, stole that uh, kind of swipe from himself for Amy Pond, perhaps? I absolutely <laughs> do, and I think that's, you know, yay on him. Um, but I had not – I had – you know, we had seen when – and we talked about this in an earlier episode um, when uh, Rose and the doctor comes back and – he thinks it's only been a month and it's been a year, right? And yeah. it shows that he <laughs> cannot fix the TARDIS. Um, you know, so this is – you show again, but as a new Whovian, mm-hmm. you know, you, you didn't get that. And you're like, how can, how can he not have control of the TARDIS? And, and it's, it's – how could it be so, you know, inaccurate – um, I love the idea, and I think, Laurie, to your point, the reason why it isn't creepy is, um, you know, she is the driving force in the flirting. She is the right. one that the I think, yeah, she is the aggressor. She she flirts with him. She's coy with him. You know, he's kind of flustered. Um, <laughs> I go back to. Um, you know, the Christmas Carol where Matt Smith talked mm-hmm. about, you know, with the young boy, right? Like, well, the Girls. first time I started noticing a girl, you know, I stole a TARDIS and got out of there because I was so bad at this. So <laughs> I, I always love seeing the doctor being um, not as necessarily – um, very experienced in things of romance, which is, I, I also know makes sense because we know he had a family. He's a grandfather. I mean, you know, but it's still. I think a lot of people view the doctor as asexual. Yes. And, and to see him, I know that um, I think I read somewhere that, you know, the idea is what if the doctor had a girlfriend, how would that work? Uh, you know, is one of the, kind of snippets about this um i love their chemistry together i love the the 
the dialogue between them and their journey. It is – you. I have not timed it, but they do not spend that much time on screen together. No. You know, you get snippets here, snippets there, snippets there. Right. And Little fleeting moments between the two. Yes. Yeah. But it's really well done and concentrated when it happens, and I – I, you know, I've seen the episode multiple times, and so even though you know what's happening at the payoff at the end when you he comes back and you know he didn't come fast enough, yep. there is a sense of sadness, mm. and, and I felt that yesterday as I was watching this, and like, what if, you know, too bad that couldn't have happened, and yeah. um, and, you know, and and there is a couple of scenes where. You know, the king asked the doctor, what did she say? And he just ignores him, doesn't say anything, and puts the, you know, the sealed the envelope, yeah. the envelope yeah. away. And, and the king, uh, you know, kind of rightly so, I understood. Um, so just right, – Quite right. Yeah, quite right, yeah. And, and just it is – it's a different side of Tenet that we had seen at this point. Right. Uh, you know, he gets to show off a little bit. Uh, there is the scene where it they they want to give the impression he's drunk. I don't know if he really is drunk or just playing. I don't drunk. think he, I think he was just playing drunk. But yeah. it's it's funny and it's 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 interesting and it is just a a lovely interaction between these two that you know tell a um I know I keep saying it but it's just a lovely love story. Yeah. That you know has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and kind of moves on. How yeah. about you, Charles? Well, one of the things that is that really I think is one of the key scenes in this story between the two is that you know that there's that moment where the doctor uses his telepathy to look into Raynette's mind. This is the older Raynette, and he's hoping to find something that you're like trying to figure out like okay, what is this connection? She, these these androids have to her, right? So he thinks, okay, well, I can just kind of look into her mind one way. But it surprises him because, you know, as, as she refers to, like, that a door, once open, maybe step through in either direction. So she's able to look into his mind, which yes. is something we rarely get a glimpse into because the doctor is so secretive, so private. Yes. And so, you know, she, she feels instantly this, this overwhelming loneliness from him. That's why she calls him her lonely angel. Yes. And, you know, she feels such sadness, but, you know, you know, she makes this comment, you know, being Moffat, of course, it, in hindsight, it's, it's perfect Moffat, right? Where she says, you know, Doctor, Doctor Who, you know, it's more than just a secret, isn't it? And she invites him to dance with her, you know, using dance as a metaphor, presumably for sex, right? Yes. And he, you know, he, and he tries to say, no, I don't dance, but, you know, she makes this great comment about, like, well, you know, every lonely little boy needs to learn how to dance. Well, and Charles, not to – I'm going to interrupt. I know I'm stealing everybody's favorite. quotes, but – No, you know, no, no, like, you're not. No. But think about that, right? Mm -hmm. In The Doctor Dances. Yes. That That is very clearly with a the Eccleston – metaphor. That, that metaphor for sex and yeah. that dancing. So this is the second time Moffat's gone to that. Right. And I think it's good. And if you look about it, like at Amy's wedding and other things, that's been a consistent theme with Moffat that he, the doctor dancing is another metaphor for um, physical contact or, right. you know, intimacy. Yeah. And, you know, there's that line that River said, by the way, where she said, did you dance at their wedding? And yes. he says, yes, yes, I did. So, you know, when he was well, looking, along, looking, all, so... looking all the drunken <laughs> giraffe, but, you know. Yes. Along those lines, back in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century, 
courting couples didn't touch. I mean, they just didn't, that was not something you did unless you danced. Um, and that was an opportunity for a man to actually touch the woman he was wanting to, uh, that he was courting, that he, it was an opportunity for them to steal some little handholds and some little in, in touches. Public, in public. In yeah. public, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now the other thing that that I thought was really powerful is, you know, we talk we talk about the ending where he watches that carriage go, and but it, for me, it's the moment after he goes back to the TARDIS, mm. and Rose and Mickey kind of look at him, and Rose kind of makes this offhand comment, "Are you like, you know, are you okay?" And he says, "Well, I'm always okay," and they kind of get the vibe that he wants to be left alone. So they leave him alone in the control room, in the console room. And this is where now that he's private, he pulls out that letter and he reads it. And he reads about how she waited for him, holding out hope for all those years, only now at the end when her health was failing. And, um, you know, it, it's it's just so powerful. And I thought Tennant did a really great job with that. And the music by Murray Gold is just, it just, it's so powerful. Yes. It just really reaches into those start strings. Like, you know, just, it 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 makes you feel that moment. And you, you, you know, for this being, you know, the doctor that's normally so private, and so withdrawn, so secretive, to really – this is probably one of the few times we really get a good look at the, the the actual man, at least until he regenerates into a woman, right? Um, but we get to look at the being. You know, look at, you know, there's the, you know, the oncoming storm, that whole, you know, mythos thing. But this is where we look at the doctor, and we see him as a real person, and – we feel his his pain at that moment, and I thought it was just a very, very powerful scene. And I think that that it's you know to give Tennant, you know, everything that he's due for that because as much as I do like the other doctors, I'm not sure that there's another doctor who could have expressed that without talking the way he did. Yeah, he's just. Tennant has just got that one, this amazing way of of acting without words. So so acting is what you're. <laughs> yeah, he's I, a, I, he's I an agree. actor who's able to act. Yes. <laughs> well, they all can act. All of the doctors act, but they are all so different. Right. Yes. And that's what gives them their charm, right? They're all individuals, Absolutely. even though they're the same person, right? All right. So, uh, anybody else have any other thoughts about the Tenth Doctor and Madame de Pompadour in this story? I, I, I'm good. You're good, Lori. Anything else you'd like to add? I think I'm good. All right. Let's move on. Topic number two. Now you're getting it. This is the line, of course. So we can talk about Rose and Mickey. I know, given certain recent developments, talking about No Clark has gotten a little awkward. But I did think it was important because this is Mickey's first official trip as a companion in this story. And he's very excited because he gets a spaceship in his first go. And some of the scenes, of the, my favorite scenes with these characters in the story are Rose finally relating to Mickey as a fellow companion in the story. She's the senior companion. She gets to show him the ropes, so to speak, and, uh, you know, gets to, you know, guide him through his first adventure in space. And and it, it, it kind of puts a little twist on their their relationship up until now, right? So I, I kind of want to get your thoughts on, and I'll start with you, Jesse, on this one first. What did you make of Rose and Mickey in this story? So I've always um, been a fan of the Mickey character. You know, yeah. he was, you know, um, when we we talked about school reunion, you know, he talked about, I, I don't want to be just the dog. Yeah, the kid and, dog. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I was glad to see him 
the excitement of a new companion. I got a spaceship on my very first. It's like yeah. it's like you know you spin the Targus the Tardis destination wheel, wheel of fortune. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. You're like, yes, I got it. No whammies. Um, no bankrupt. It, it, yeah. <laughs> I also I did not write the line down, and so if this is one of y'all's, hopefully you have it. Where where he he kind of gives Rose a hard time about. Man, you know, basically, the doctor's a ladies' man. Oh yeah, right. And, Where he's kind of he kind of taunts her about like his past relationships, like with yeah, Cleopatra. And, yes, like Cleo. He called her Cleo. And, <laughs> yeah, and and I kind of like that because you know Rose is not very nice to Mickey. She's no, she she's not. Doesn't treat him well at all, and so I kind of like seeing him a little bit, you know, standing up for himself. Um, now remember, also this is, this episode takes place right after school reunion. Yes, <laughs> where you know Rose got to meet Sarah Jane Smith. Yes, and realizes now that she wasn't the first companion the Doctor ever, you know, brought aboard the TARDIS. Right, so so she's yeah. already kind of like reevaluating their relationship a little bit when this story hit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they had some good moments together, um, and I, you know, I liked it. Um, just a taste of Rose being a little bit just jealous, didn't mm-hmm. have a lot much more to do in the episode. Which jealous, I, I, jealous of Madame de Pompadour, yeah. Right. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it, it's the reality is I'm watching this episode for that main love story, you know, so it was okay with me, but it was yeah. good to see, and I, you know, it's always, um, and, and as you said, I know it's, it's awkward um, sometimes when things you find out in the past, but it was good to see him. And it, it was this good kind of see that eagerness of a new companion excitement about what's going on. Yeah. I don't want to let, I don't want to let the whole no Clark thing ruin this episode for me. Exactly. Yes. I don't want him to take that away from me, because because this one's a special one. So, so you know, that, that's my context. You know, everybody else, that's up to you. I, you know, you're right. perfectly entitled to your own feelings about this, but that's just how I personally approach it. So I agree. And Lori, how about you? What did you make of Rose and Mickey in this story? <clears throat> For me, you know, there's little bits and pieces of Mickey, but I'm like Jesse. I watch it for the the Madame de Pompadour mm-hmm. and Doctor part. Right. But the one piece that is kind of surprising for me is, yes, you've got those moments of Rose being really jealous about Madame de Pompadour. But when she goes to tell her about what's going to happen and that the Doctor will be there, there's that real sympathetic moment between the two of them that – it's almost like kind of sisters in in emotion kind of thing. It was I thought that that was a beautiful moment between her and Madame de Pompadour, especially when Renette decides to walk through the tapestry and wasn't as scared to walk through the tapestry into this other world. So it was kind of an interesting way of seeing them in each other's world for a second. Now, if I was Mickey, I wouldn't have been as excited about the – a spaceship as having 17th century France and the, the fireplace <laughs> on the spaceship, you know, but that's just me. Um, well, uh, well, you are a woman Mickey, and he's a, you're like a younger guy. So he's going to think spaceships are cool, right? I'm in space. How awesome is that? <laughs> to put it, to be fair, spaceships right? Spaceships are cool. There's certain spaceships I think are really cool. That one I'm not so sure had I known the name of it earlier on, I probably would have thought it was a little more cool. But um, Mickey, for me, has always been kind of one of those sad little characters in Doctor Who because he never really gets what he wants until we get a little farther in and he gets to go to the other Earth and be and actually do right by his grandmother and in the very in the very next nature. story, yeah, Rise of the Cyber, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's where he he kind of comes into his own there. Um, here he's just kind of running around and kind of playing action figure in a in a video game, rolling on the floor with his little gun. And I th- see, I kind of thought that was kind of funny. I thought it was that he was just kind of enjoying himself. He's like, yeah, this is awesome, right? 
I guess maybe I've just watched enough too too many of these to know that there's going to be something in the around the corner that you shouldn't right. be enjoying yourself in a corridor <laughs> you should be running. Good point. That's a very good point. Yeah, I guess, uh, <laughs> it's you know it's just a matter of time before you get your life threatened by an, an alien or a robot or in this case an android, yep. right? An android sticking you with a needle to put you to sleep so they can put you on their little chopping up beds, yeah. Their operating tables, yeah, exactly. And play Operation <laughs> no, Home Game. No, chopping up beds. Right. <laughs> Sorry if I'm bringing up bad memories, Jesse. No, no, that, that no, no. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've got my own, to be fair. i got my own bad memories on that. So, um, but I, I, I you know, I, kind of, I thought it was really interesting to see Rose with Mickey because – you know, like it for you know. Obviously, you know when they were on Earth, they had a little nice relationship until the Doctor showed up, and then Rose kicks Mickey to the curb really fast at the end of Rose, right, and says, "Okay, see ya," uh, and she jumps on the you know on the TARDIS, right. So Mickey has some resentment toward her because she's off with the Doctor. And then when she would come back to Earth, but but now their relationship is different again because now they're like on a little bit more equal footing. You know, like okay, now I get to see what you've been experiencing, and I kind of get it now. And and Rose kind of kind of guides him through that. You know, there's that big great moment where you know the, the, she talks about to Mickey and says, "Hey, you know." Uh, you know, so are we going to stay here like the doctor wants us to or, or what? And he kind of looks at her for a moment, then without saying anything, goes over, grabs one of those big fire extinguisher guns. And yes. she goes, now you're getting it. So it's like now, now you're getting into the groove. Now you see the, the, the potential of this. And there is that great scene where the doctor, like, they never do what I tell. They never do. Like, mm-hmm. they, why don't they ever listen? Which was I, I, always nice to see. Yeah, and I thought they were very essential because they kind of get a little bit more of the mystery. They get to piece things together, you know, like when they're exploring the ship and they're like, oh, the camera's got an eye in it. and mm-hmm. Or like, you know, there's a heart, you know, in there. Right. And, and so they kind of help the doctor piece together what's going on with this yes, they very do. strange ship. Yes. So I'm going to have to politely disagree with you um, on the whole. Yes. I know, right? <laughs> on the whole Mickey Rose relationship beforehand, I don't think it was a great or a good, even really a good relationship before the doctor. I think that Rose didn't know anything else, but was wanting something else. And I think she did not know what that was until the doctor stepped into her world. And I'm going to say that I'm a little bit of a, um, I know what I'm talking about because I settled long time ago. And then there was this certain person by the name of Charles Skaggs so that settled, jumped into huh? my life. <laughs> Yes, so um, I would have jumped onto a TARDIS way back when with you. So I think it was, uh, she just didn't know anything, you know, she didn't, it wasn't what she, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't what she was wanting until the, and then she didn't know what she was wanting until the doctor jumped in. I mean, she didn't want to be a keeper in a shop and a worker in a shop and those things. Yeah, but you notice she didn't just like sit Mickey down though and go like, Hey, and you know, I'm sorry about this, but you know, like I have this opportunity and you know, if you don't want to come along, you know, I want to go do this. She didn't let him down easy. She just was like, oh, see ya. She wouldn't and, have, and Mickey's it, like going, what, what just oppor- happened? <laughs> it was an opportunity of a lifetime. She probably wasn't even thinking. I mean, to be fair, she didn't even say goodbye to her mom. No, that's true. I'll give you that. That's yes. a good point. That's a great point. All right. Anything else about Rose or Mickey from anybody you want to talk about? All right. Third and final topic. We did not have the pots. So let's talk about the clockwork droids who obviously, like they say, don't have the parts. And let's talk about that interesting ship, the SS Madame de Pompadour. So um, this is the first, like I said, this is the first time we see the clockwork droids. And um, I thought they were a very cool concept. You know, we find out that 
for whatever reason, you know, they're they're they've dialed in to uh, they've created all these time windows, and and the doctor brings up that they've expended so much energy to create these time windows, and the doctor's like, well, why don't you just use that for your ship? But there's a purpose behind this, and we don't find out until the very end of the episode really what that purpose is. Even the doctor doesn't know it. He just has a has a theory that they've been scanning uh, Madame de Pompadour's brain and talking about how she's not ready yet. But why her specifically? We don't find that out until the very end. So what did you so I'll start with you, Lori, first on this one. What did you make of the clockwork droids and the you know the the why they were kind of stalking Renit throughout time? I thought they were cool. I thought that they were a really creepy mm-hmm. villain for especially a little girl, you know, because the monsters under the bed kind of thing. We always think of, you know, right. vampires or whatever, but this is a totally different vampire, <laughs> a totally different monster. And when the doctor tells her that um, the clock isn't ticking and it's broken, why is the, why is there ticking in your room kind of thing? And the look on young Renette's face was, it was like, oh my gosh, I hadn't even thought about that because, you know, I mean, so I thought that was really, really brilliantly done from that perspective. I could, they could be creepy to me. I mean, yeah. that could be very scary. Um, the fact that they were looking for Madame de Pompadour, the first time we watched that just totally had me completely confused. It was like, okay, how's this going to tie in? Why, why France? Why Madame de Pompadour? You know, but um, having the ship, what really got me, and this is why this still gets a five tissue box rating from me yeah. is that picture of Madame de Pompadour that's on the ship and how they fade from that to the name of the SS Madame yeah. de Pompadour still gives me chills. I mean, I can, I get the chills just talking, thinking about it. I think it, it finally connects and I love that about Moffat and a lot of his stuff. He'll start with something at the very beginning of the episode. Right. And even, and if it, even if it's two episodes long, he doesn't always end it until that that very last closing piece. You don't get the full circle of the story until that very end. And I think it's very creative that he does it that way. I think it's great because it keeps you like on the edge of your seat the entire time. Yeah, it's masterful writing as far as I'm concerned because, you know, it ends on such a strong note this episode with Mm -hmm. that painting and the reveal, you know, as we go to the exterior of the ship. And where we see the SS Madame de Pompadour. So Jesse, how about you? What are your what are your thoughts on the clockwork droids in the in the ship? So I have to confess, the first time I watched the episode, mm-hmm. I didn't get what that payoff meant. Uh, you know that the, oh, the reason why they were wanting her mm-hmm. is their ship is named after her. So therefore, they think they needed. Um, instead of just any brain, they wanted to get the brain that the ship was named off of. And and so once I got that, I went, oh, duh. <laughs> that, they, they showed it very clearly. Uh, made it great. A, so did it, um, make, it, gave, did it feel more powerful then once you understood it? Did it did feel very powerful. Um, a really well done, creepy villain. Um, it is the, the – Seeing them in the the wigs and the the very elaborate coats and in lace, you know, yeah. frilly lacy shirts, you know, and them the ticking and the whirling, um, really well done. Um, it is a um, it is a it was a great look, um, and as you talk, talked about, you know the. Um, she has a great line about you know the the doctor and the monsters. You don't get one without the other, right. which is yes. um, you know, and and those are one of those um, lines where, like when Neil Gaiman, you know, when the TARDIS, when Sexy says, 
And he says, you didn't always take me where I wanted to go. And she says, I always took you where you needed to go. Right. I think that is – that line is – without being overly – it's a meta line. It is a perfect yeah. line for the episode, but it is also a perfect line about the series itself. The, the monsters and the Doctor are tied together. Yeah. And one of the reasons why the show works so well – whether they're the cheesy, bad plastic, you know, monsters uh, from, you know, the, the, the classic early era. classic hair or this yeah. modern do, uh, the modern who. So I just love that line and I love it. Um, it is – and they are creepy without being creepy. And what I mean is they're, they're not – they do not have evil intent. You know, their job – we've got to repair the ship. Yeah. Our job is to repair the ship. They're robots. So, so essentially, yeah, they're just yeah. doing what their programming yeah. entails. Yeah, and, and my, I actually feel sorry for them at the end. When they realize that they can't get back to the ship and they just crumble, I actually feel sorry for them at the end. And, and yes, they – they know that you know the crew died right because of what they did and but just the matter of uh, you know we didn't have the parts we didn't have the parts i mean that yeah. is a creepy creepy line and a really really well done villain yeah cuz you if you think about it i mean this these clockwork droids because they didn't have the parts like they like to say over and over um they cannibalized the human crew right Yes, they killed them. They they took their organs, their eyes, their hearts, whatever, and you know wove them into the circuitry of the ship. Like, hey, we need a pump, so let's get a heart. Or you know, in order to make this camera work, well, let's use an eye, and kind yes. of created this this very bizarre, almost like um, you know, this cybernetic being. Well, and, and in a lot of ways, you know, that it's almost like this this very bizarre Frankenstein monster cobbled together yes. of, of humanoid and machine parts, the cyborg well, in a lot and, of ways. And, you know, and the whole purpose would to be re to repair the ship for the crew. Yes. And so you sacrifice the crew to help the ship, which – Serves would, no purpose. You would think there would be like some like does not compute going on, but <laughs> yes, apparently exactly, not. You right. know, like like yeah. okay, we're repairing the ship for the crew, but we need the crew to repair the ship, and does yeah. not compute, and then psh, they should just glitch out, and, and right? Obviously, they do not father uh, follow Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're like F Asimov. Forget this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but but. They were a very elegant design. You, you know, you mentioned the, the the clockwork sounds. So it gave you that little bit of menacing, like, because you, you could hear it without actually seeing them. So you got creeped out by the sound. And then, you know, once you finally got to see them, they, you know, for just being, you know, gears and, you know, um, and, you know, just the, in certain, you know, parts that, they were able to form, you know, like these swords that could threaten Mickey and Rose when they were on the operating table or like, you know, when they took them hostage or whatever that. So, you you like you see these spinning gears. So it was very menacing. So, it, you know, it was something that I don't think a child would have been overly afraid of, but it was still menacing. Right. So yes. um, just a very elegant design. And then. You know, the way they you – know, with the reveal of the SS Madame de Pompadour is just it, – it, like like Laurie said, it brings the whole thing together. Um, you, you – in that moment, you, like, realize, oh, that's it. You get this light bulb in your head going, that's it. That's why they wanted her. And, yes. And it brings such a pathos to the ending that, yes. you know, you, you're like – this is just horrible, you know. Like that, that this ship is now doomed um, <laughs> to wander space, and you know it's now an empty vessel because now even the the clockwork droids aren't there, and so it's just it's just traveling through space, and you know it's like this like this old haunted mansion, th th you know, traveling through the cosmos. So it's it's very sad. <laughs> 
in a lot of ways. It is. I agree. So, but all around, just just an amazing kind of mimics story. Her life. It kind of mimics Madame de Pompadour's life, if you think about it, because right. it worked hard and it was there for its crew and and whatever it was that they were supposed to be doing. But then at the end, it's getting weary and it's breaking down and there's not enough time left. And then it goes off into nothingness. It's kind of a symbolic. I think that's kind of interesting. Yes, symbolic. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah. so the ship is almost symbolic of Madame de Pompadour's life. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. I think that's fair. All right. Anybody else have any other thoughts about this story? Because it's just an amazing story. All right. So now we come to uh, ratings. Or no, no, no. Let's let's wait. Let's do the quotes first. Then we'll do the ratings. I'm a little out of a practice because I got Jesse here now. So I'd like I've thrown out my <laughs> rhythm. I got used to like, okay, Jesse's not here. Now, I'm he- now he's here. So I was like, oh, yeah, we need to do this. So uh, favorite quotes. Uh, Jesse, I'll start with you on this one. You, you want to give us some of your um, favorite quotes of this story. So we talked already about this, um, but I do love it when Renette says, you and I both know, don't we, Rose? The doctor is worth the monsters. One may tolerate a world of demons for the sake of an angel. Um, absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And um, and then I'll only do one other because I, I don't want to take anything a word. You're always um, so unselfish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I love, I love an arrogant doctor. Yeah. I love the arrogance. I know the quote you're going to say. And what the hell is going on? You know, and Renette says, Oh, this is my lover, the King of France and the doctor. Yeah. Well, I'm the Lord of time. (laughs) Just this arrogance (laughs) that you just love. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, uh, the doctor's trying to a little jealous a little bit. It's like, Hey, it was a little bit like, Oh, Hey, you're the King of France. Well, I'm the Lord of time, baby. Top that. (laughs) Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's, that was, that was one of mine that I had. So that's good. Good. All right. Uh, Lori, we'll go with you. What are your, some of your Oh, my God. Ones? Narrow it down. Narrow it down. <laughs> I know. I know. The first one that I really thought was really kind of, really kind of brings home Renette all together is mm-hmm. when um, he, when the doctor asks her how old she is, and she says, so impertinent a question so early in the conversation. How promising. I thought that was kind of. Sophia Miles okay, delivered that line and, so perfectly. And that's why when we talked about writing, she is the aggressor. Yeah. You yeah know, she was, that, is, that is such she, a great flirt, line. It's such a yes. flirtatious line. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, another one that I really love in that same conversation is her, such a lonely little boy, lonely, lonely then and lonelier now. How can you bear it? I just, it makes me want to cry to think about the doctor. He's always got all these people around, but he is truly, honestly, so alone. And then the doctor saying, you know, that um, she's, how could she be lonely? You've never been very alone. And then he realizes exactly that she's talking about him. That whole piece just really kind of gets me that whole conversation really kind of nails in to me that whole they fall in love in that conversation yeah that has yeah, those couple of posts in it i think that's where they truly honestly fall in love with each other i agree so their child so i'm i'm gonna be good because uh-huh. there's lots of others but uh, okay. those are my two okay <laughs> all right if you have any more feel free Go ahead. I'll okay. let you have a turn. Okay. All right. Well, I'll I'll choose a fun one here. So the doctor, um, he's a little confused at this moment. He realizes who Renette is, and he goes, "Poisson? No, no, no way. Renette Poisson. Later, Madame de Etois. Later, still mistress of Louis the Fifteenth, uncrowned queen of French of France." Actress, artist, musician, dancer, courtesan, fantastic gardener. And the French servant says, who the hell are you? And the doctor replies, you know, as he's whirling around the the fireplace, 
I'm the doctor, and I just snogged Madame de Pompadour. <laughs> and once again, you talked about her delivering a line. Yes. He delivers that line. Right. Just, it is a smash. It is just so <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. And then, let's see, I'll go with um, Renette saying, Doctor, Doctor Who, it's more than just a secret, isn't it? And then the doctor replies, what did you see? And Renette replies, that there is a time, there comes a time, Time Lord, when every little lonely boy must learn how to dance. Well done. Well done. I got one more. I have okay. to. All right, go ahead. So this is the Rosen and Renette conversation. And I think it shows just how brilliant Madame de Pompadour was in that time frame because Rose is like, how do I tell this person from 17th century France about a ship? And it's, I think it's just brilliant. Rose is, er, they say a vessel, a ship, a sort of sky ship, and it's full of, well, you, different bits of your life in different rooms all jumbled up. I told you it was complicated. Sorry. And then Renette replies, there's a vessel in your world where the days of my life are pressed together like the chapters of a book so that he may step through from one to another without increase of age, while I, weary traveler, must always take the slower path. I mean, it's so amazing how fast she grasps that yes, because right. people in 17th century France would not grasp the whole skyship concept. Right. Well, I think that's why she was special and why the doctor was attracted mm -hmm. to her. So. I agree. And then lastly, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to do a line that Lori has probably heard me say far more often than not, where Rose asks, are you all right? And the doctor replies, I'm always all right. <laughs> I can see you doing that on a I, regular basis. Lori is my is my witness here, right? Yes. <laughs> so. That's kind of like when your wives say, "I'm fine." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Only a little bit more tragic, right? With the doctor. Yeah. All right. So, what's everybody's ratings for this story? I'm get. I kind of guess what everybody's gonna as far as numbers go, but uh, Lori, I'll start with you first. What's your rating for this story? Ten fireplaces. All right. That's good. And Jesse, how about you? Ten out of ten horses smashing mirrors. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Bravo. And I'm going to make it unanimous. As all three of us give it a ten out of ten, I'm going to give it a ten out of ten accidentally invented banana daiquiris. Very nice. Well done. We didn't even get into that. No, we didn't get into the banana yeah. daiquiri thing. Yeah. So, um, but uh, I got it. I worked it in at least a little bit. All right. A for you. All yeah. right. So reverse the polarity. As yes. We reverse the polarity, the neutron flow. This time, because of the sake of time, I'm going to keep this very short. Uh, especially out of, we out of, knew, we knew yeah. that me returning right. this thing, this one was going to go long. In fact, Charles was like, "All right, give me a signal if you yes. get tired, Jesse." And well, I'm like, of, "Nope, I am loving this." Out of, out of consideration for Jesse, I'm going to yes. just say, if you enjoyed the girl in the fireplace, I recommend that we go back, way, way back, to 1964 with the Reign of Terror. This was the eighth serial of season one in 1964, written by Dennis Spooner. And what this involves is the first doctor, William Hartnell, uh, his granddaughter, Susan Foreman, and sc school teachers Ian Chesterton and Barbara Wright, the very first TARDIS team, arriving in Paris out in 18th century France. So the very same century, just years, maybe a couple, few decades later than this story. You said 18th century France? This 18th, was 17th century France, so about 100 no, years. No, this was, in you know, this story, Renette, when the doctor first meets Renette, it's 1727, right? That's 18th century. Then you know what? They're wrong. Um, Rose is wrong on the, the show because she says 17th century France. Yes, yeah, she is. It's 18th century. 
right? Because here we are in yeah. 2021, and it's the 21st century, right? You jump ahead for the century. So, yep. So it's the same same century, and it's France. So that's the main connection, obviously. But this is also a historical in a lot of ways, although it doesn't have clockwork droids. But, but essentially what we do is we explore the French Revolution, and this, particularly this moment called the Reign of Terror, which was kind of like this feud between two political groups that was going on at this time. And um, it's a very pretty good episode. I, I, it's one of those we haven't talked about here on the podcast. They actually finished it up with some really excellent animation top, before they started skimping on the, on the animation for the videos. So I really recommend checking this one out. Um, it's, a, it's like I said, it's the original TARDIS team. This is only the eighth story ever of Doctor Who. So, uh, so if you enjoy the girl in the fireplace, I definitely recommend the Reign of Terror. Everybody, please check that one out. It's worth the it's worth the effort. It's six episodes, but it's a solid historical story of Doctor Who. If you enjoy those, very nice. All right, now listener feedback. We thankfully got some feedback just yesterday from Holly Mack, one of our regular. Listeners and occasional co-host here on Next Stop Everywhere, writing it about the girl in the fireplace. So Holly writes in, hey, all. Hey, Holly. Hey, Holly. Hi, Holly. I forgot how much I enjoyed this episode when it first came out. Nice to see Sophia Miles again. I remember her from the short-lived TV series Moonlight. See, I'm not the only one. Exactly. Granted, this episode came out before she was on Moonlight. I came to New Who at the start of the third season, I think, and caught up. Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey at its best. Love the parallels between Renette and Amy with the doctor going back and forth in her timeline. So it's another comparison to Amy Pond. At least one of them didn't wait for him. Well, I think they both did, didn't they? They both waited. Yeah. Yes, doctor, your rule number one don't wander off. Well, as we know, rule number one is, you know, the doctor lies, right? Yes. So, but here she says, don't wander off has been broken by many companions, though it would be helpful to hand out a list of rules to your incoming companions, right? There would be, yes. <laughs> like we talked about this, though. The doctor needs a fact sheet. There Fre is. Frequently asked questions sheet, right? There, there absolutely. <laughs> and as we talked about in, in our spinoff, yeah. Um, where you would have the TARDIS uh, companion support group would have a list of good, good, you know, really good running shoes or walking shoes, right? Yes. You need some Merrells. You need some strong. Yeah. You, you need Compan a certain tips things. for companions. Yes. 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 Your backpack should carry a, a, a cheese sandwich as well as <laughs> you know, a towel. Uh, nice gram reset. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. So um, let's see what else. Holly says, the scene with the doctor getting drunk on banana daiquiris and saying that he created them had me chuckling. Also, the doctor finding a horse in the spaceship and Rose saying he can't keep it and the doctor retorting, I let you keep Mickey, had me chuckling. That was another good line. Yeah. So essentially, the, they're both pets, right? So yes. the doctor, <laughs> The doctor views Mickey as Rose's pet. Yes. Uh, let's see. The synchronization of the Doctor is a touch more jealous of Mickey than the Ninth Doctor was. The clockwork men are all kinds of creepy. With a mix of the Autons <clears throat> with voices along the lines of the Cybermen and then a steampunk-like vibe. Very steampunkish. You know, we hadn't thought yep. about that, but yep. I really agree with that. The meeting between Renette and Rose and them talking about things went a bit better than when she first met Sarah Jane in the episode prior to this. So I think that helped. The doctor talking to the clockwork leader that their time is running out almost made you feel for them, but at least they understood in a way and it didn't try to do something desperate at the last minute. The end with the doctor getting excited about taking Renette on a trip to the sea, the stars, and then coming back to the fireplace to find out that he was too late and that she had died was a heartbreaking scene. Yes, yes, it was. A great episode that has rewatchability. I'll wrap it up here. Holly from Wisconsin. Thank you, Holly. 
Thank you, Holly, so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, we always love hearing from Holly, uh, whether she's here talking with us or writing in. And uh, it's nice to know she enjoyed this episode as much as we do. So, Absolutely. Uh, well, you know, Charles, if someone wants to join the cool kids and give us feedback, how can they? Right. So if everybody you want to be like Holly and you do, write to us. Next Stop Everywhere, smg at gmail.com. That's Next Stop Everywhere, SMG, for Southgate Media Group at the gmail.com. Or you can find us on Twitter at Next Stop SMG on Twitter. Facebook, of course, Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, or Instagram at Next Stop Everywhere podcast. And Jesse, where can they find you when you're not recuperating and um, probably working on some other podcast? Yes, I am. Uh, I am not spending a lot of time on social media right now. Um, there Understandably, is a, yeah, there is a caring bridge. Uh, Charles has been kind enough to post it on both our Facebook page and you know retweeted it not only himself but through Next Stop Everywhere Twitter where uh, we are doing anytime significant happens we're doing an update there so if you are interested in following in my health journey that's probably the best way to go um, I am on Twitter at Jesse Jackson DFW if I've been posting anything it's usually on Twitter I have not been going to Facebook very much lately just because. You can only do so much. Um, I, I am. There are many things Charles and I have in common, and mm-hmm. one of the things is Charles is incredibly organized <laughs> and, and and very detail oriented. Um, my okay. my obsession with set lusting Bruce is that I would run out of episodes. So I have not recorded a new episode of except for two short episodes since like the first part of March. And I still have three episodes left in the can <laughs> that I'm going to release. So I had almost like tw- you stockpiled. Eight, 12 episodes of block filed. So uh, there have been new set lesson groups episodes uh, while I'm out. Uh, I'm down to three left. I am starting to book guests. So if you want to talk music, if you want to talk Bruce Springsteen, if you want to talk, you know, the power of rock and roll, um, please reach out to me. I will be needing guests because I have wiped out my <laughs> bank shows. Uh, but yes, and so there have been some really fun episodes. I know Zan still wants to talk with you. Yes. I, 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 in fact, I saw that. I was like, I should. Zan would be one. She'd be fabulous um, on that show. Yeah, she would be amazing. And there's a couple other uh, people have reached out to me that I'm hoping – that I'll be able to book in the next couple of weeks that that'll be pretty special. But well, if you um, ever get desperate, you know, you can grab me and I can, I'll do you another know episode we, with you. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Just let me know so, if you need somebody. So, Charles, I do not know if there is a Southgate Media podcast that doesn't have you involved somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, for, well, first, well, first, I want to ask everybody if they want to, Lori, I know. Um, if anybody wants to get a hold of you on social media, do you want to share that, how they can find you? They can find me on Facebook at Lori Skaggs. They can find me through you. <laughs> it's okay. probably the easiest way. Um, I and mean, I know I can find you in my house, but, yes. you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about all that I have from a face or from a social media standpoint uh, it's, um, is my Facebook page. But um, it's, yeah. They're, okay. they're welcome to reach out to me. Just let okay. me know that it's because of this. Um, but can I, I've got one other little thing. If okay. anybody sure. ever wants to learn a little bit more about Madame de Pompadour right. and likes to read books but and likes to read biographies but not the 5,000-page um, play-by-plays, there's a wonderful book called Madame de Pompadour, Mistress of France. Ooh. It's by Christine Pevitt. P E V I T T Al Grant A L G R A N T and it's under 300 pages and it's okay. pretty good size print and it's it's got it's a really good overview of her life and it's an easy read. Cool. Oh, that sounds interesting. Excellent. Excellent. Do you want to promote Colony Cats? Oh, <laughs> my other obsession You're in welcome. life. You're welcome. <laughs> I, when I'm not around my husband, I am helping with rescuing the cats and dogs of the Columbus and surrounding areas uh, with colony cats. 
Our, the website's colonycats.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Colony Cats and Dogs. Excellent. All right, everybody, have... everybody, please go there and support Lori. They do Lori. really great work. They, they do. do. Yes. So support them, everybody. We have actually placed around 15,000 dogs and cats into homes since 2009. That's amazing. That's that's, that's great work. That's fantastic. That is amazing. Yes. All right. So, Jesse, before I interrupt you, I'm sorry. I just wanted to uh, let Lori know. No, no, no. Shot. I'm really glad. No, I was just uh, – I was going to let you share um, – uh, I, 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 I'm going to take the moment. Excuse me, Charles. I'm going to take control sure. for a moment. Go ahead. Laura, I am sorry I made you a podcast widow. <laughs> I, you know, it's all your seven fault, years Jackson. ago, I reached out to Charles. I said, hey, Rob Southgate wants to do a Doctor Who podcast. Do you want to do it? I've never done a podcast. Well, it's easy, Charles. You just get a mic and we talk. Sure. <laughs> Seven years later, mm-hmm. um, he is in so many. So um, many. I know it brings him great happiness, and he is amazing at it. But I just as as your father <laughs> and your <laughs> long term friend, yep. I apologize for making you a podcast widow. <laughs> No apology is necessary. It just makes me not have to feel guilty about my volunteer activities with Colony Cats. Yep. That, you know, I, and she I, doesn't I, have to I, deal with me for like two hours at a time, right? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I will tell you, um, that is one of the things that has made Lynn and I a really strong marriage is, um, you know, her exercise and her work and the things she does. I am totally supportive of her, and then she's supportive of the podcast. So you can have an incredibly strong marriage and a close marriage with each of you having individual. I think it actually makes it a stronger marriage, a healthier by having your own interest and and being able to share that. 100% agree. The people, the marriages I see where the only things that they do are things with each other, a lot of most of those do not survive. There I, has to be an external thing because you don't talk about everything with the person who is closest to you, and you yeah. and you don't all you're not the same person, so you can't have the same interest in absolutely everything all the time. No, and it, and it, but you know by the same token, it's also good to have common interests. Yes, right. but absolutely. that doesn't need to be exclusive. You know, you exactly. can have common interests, and then you can also have outside interests, right? Absolutely, yes. Fun fact about Charles and me: we actually do much better together when we are in stressful situations yes. than when it's just yes, normal day. When yes. we are on our travels to the United Kingdom or any place else, and this last year with the whole COVID and being stuck in the house twenty four seven practically with each other. We have probably been the best that we have been in in years. Well, you know, she's upstairs in the living room taking that over for her work, and I'm I'm downstairs in the basement of solitude, you know, doing the podcast thing. So and working, so it worked out That's pretty good. well, right? You know, we yes, like I agree, we do uh, we do fantastic in stressful Absolutely. situations. And the travels, I mean, we've even when we've been on our trips. Um, And we we typically use a um, tour company when we're over in the UK because we don't want to have to drive and and look at the scenery at the same time. Mm -hmm. Even the people that are the other couples that are on there have on the tour bus with us have commented on how well we get along and we can see the how stressed these other couples are getting the longer we get on go on the the trip because you can start seeing the little bickerings as they're getting as they're getting towards the end of the trip and we're just sitting there going "Eh," and holding hands even more (laughs) (laughs) all right so as for me you can find me at charles skeggs on the twitter machine or at charles skeggs on instagram or Facebook, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio, and my blog, Geeky Things. Wait for it. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on Next Stop Everywhere. So Doctor Who, Torchwood, Sarah Jane Adventures, Big Finish, Audios, and more. All kinds of comic book sci-fi news. News my other podcasts for the Southgate Media Group, including, well, hey, the Phantom Zone podcast. Where currently DJ Nick and I, we just finished up Jupiter's Legacy, and uh, which was on Netflix based on the Image Comics series. We're taking a week off, and then we're going to be going back to the Marvel Cinematic Universe 
for a show that a lot of people are looking forward to, Loki, starring Tom Hiddleston. We'll be doing that for the next six weeks. And then after that, who knows? We'll we'll figure something out. But for but that's our plans on that. And uh, we're both looking forward to it. And Jesse, you know, if you're feeling up to it, you could join us over there. Just saying. So, not, I am not exaggerating, Charles. Yes. I am not doing, I'm like, okay, when we finish, yeah. uh, let me talk to Charles about maybe joining for Loki. Because, <laughs> you know, cause I, I missed Winter Soldier. Yeah. I mean, I needed the break. Right, I understand. Only six episodes. Right. I think that, you know, I actually did. I say you should talk to Charles about that. <laughs> well, I guess we'll just have to discuss that now. Yes, we? we will. Yes, right. we will. Well, I'm sure Nick Can would. Can we say uh, addiction? Well, yes. <laughs> well, you know, I know Nick would love it if Jesse came back yes, on the I, podcast. I think so. so. That would be so, fun. So, and I know I certainly would too, obviously. Yeah. All right. So, so there's the Phantom Zone podcast, but then there's also Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast they do with Zan Sprouse, whom you've heard here on Next Stop Everywhere, where we talk all things Twin Peaks, David Lynch, and we're going to be hopefully recording on Thursday our second part of our three-part series uh, where we go through David Lynch's hotel room, which was this very, very obscure, short-lived um, HBO miniseries from 1993. And the second episode features Griffin Dunn and also features Mariska Hargitay from Law & Order Special Victims Unit. So um, you know, my wife, Lori, might find that one a little bit interesting. And uh, then last but certainly not least, Drunk Cinema, where mm-hmm. this past weekend we had a ball as Zan and I, you know, normally we do our, our adult beverages, our adult conversation, watch our favorite movies. But this time we were joined by Christine Peruski, who, of course, you've also heard here on Next Stop Everywhere where we talked Clue, the 1985 murder mystery comedy starring Tim Curry, Eileen Brennan, Madeline Kahn, um, it's, you know, Michael McKeon. Just a, it's just a, a, a fantastic movie. It was a movie that I hadn't seen previously. and uh, But, you know, Zan and Christine were huge fans of. And it was a, it was a ball because, you know, now we had Christine on as our first special guest host on that and hopefully not our last, but it was a lot of fun. And then coming up next, by our viewer poll demand on Facebook, we're going to be discussing Ghostbusters 1984, the comedy classic, of course, starring Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Hal Ramis, um, Ernie Hudson, Sigourney Weaver, Rick Moranis. So it's a movie that Zan and I quote endlessly to one another. So you know we're going to have a lot of fun with this one, and I hope everybody checks it out on Drug Cinema. Other than that, um, Jesse, does uh, do you have any other announcements you'd like to make here for Next Stop Everywhere? Well, so I uh, before I had gotten sick, mm-hmm. I had been talking to Charles and Nick about that I was um, – I was getting a little tired of uh, doing a episode review podcast. Um, mm-hmm. And and so um, – and Charles had said, well, take a step back. You know, Go ahead and just, just enjoy some time. I said we have a – luckily, we are blessed with wonderful listeners, and we have a, a great cast of – you know, um, special guest companions. A, yeah. yeah, we have, you know, we have an easy de- dozen people that are regulars that want to join us. And so, Jesse, just go and take some time off. So the plan had been for me to um, this would have been my final episode and then I would have taken a break. Then I got sick and did it. So um, I will um, I, I am probably not going to be on at a regular basis, though. Charles is going to include me on the list of here's the episodes and mm-hmm. has kept an open door. Like all you gotta do, Jesse is say, Hey, you feel like joining me. And so I will do that as, as my health and I, my time feels. Um, 
so I, I wanted everyone to know that this is not something that we had not planned. You know, Charles is like, hey, I get it. We get it. Uh, we've been doing this a long time. So um, I know you are about to do a whole new round of, uh, you know, scheduling. Yeah. And so uh, I'm looking forward to it. So um, I do wish, please, um, you know. Because we're my, good for the summer. I've got us planned out yeah. for the summer. Oh, yeah. good. And so, um, and then also, you know, with my day job, when I go back, um, the summer is our busiest job time. So it is sometimes I can't get off in time for us to record. Yeah. So that'll be good. So we're going to work that out. So please, um, I would love to hear from people. If you have success stories about people who have fought cancer that have gone through weight loss surgery, please uh, reach out to me. Um, Probably setlustingbruce at gmail.com is the best email address. Uh, if you send it to Next Stop Everywhere, Charles will uh, forward it to me. Of course. Um, the, I cannot tell you the amount of joy and happiness and, and the sense of peace that I have received through all our listeners. I, I you know, I feel the positive vibes. I feel the the prayer and the support and, and you know, the good thoughts uh, that people have sent, and it means the world to me. Um, in fact, I have told anyone that if you um, send me your mailing address to Set Lessing Bruce and I have – um, I have a couple of Set Lessing Bruce stickers I want to send to anyone who has supported me through any means, not just financially, but through support and kind words. And so I'd love to hear it. So that's uh, where we are. But uh, I've got to tell you, this scratched my itch a lot, Charles. <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, I have not po- – like I said, I've done two little Set Lessing Bruce podcasts since then, and yep. this is – you know, did, did you get your fix? Over. Did you get? Did, uh, no, it, it almost like maybe I want. Well, do I really need to take off? Uh, this was so much fun. This well, was good. So fun. Well, that's great. That's great. And obviously, you know, I keep telling you this: your health is more important than podcasts. Yes. So you need to do what's right for you. I'm sure all of our listeners completely understand. And if they don't, well, they can talk to me about that. But yes. I'm pretty sure everybody will understand your reasons. Yes. And, um, you know, we're obviously our thoughts are with you right now. You know, we, like you said, we're sending you all the positive vibes we can right now. And, yeah. you know, we're in your corner, okay? And we love you and we care about you and we want you to get through this. And And we're all thinking about you. So... So we're here Look, whenever you need cry, us. Charles. Oh, I'm don't totally make gonna make you cry. cry. I'm gonna pull <laughs> Stephen Moffat to make you cry if I can. But, <laughs> but, but you know we're here for you. And you know if you ever need us for anything, let us know, okay? You know, I will. Because we I care will. about you, and you know you're family to us. Lori backed me up on this. Same here. You know that you are family to us. It's okay to ask for help. That is the hardest thing for any of us to do because we're all such independent people. But yes, it yeah. is okay to ask for help. Exactly. So, so you know, just you need anything, let us know. Whenever you're ready to come back, you just let me know, and we'd be more than happy to have you back on anytime you want. So uh, open invitation, as always. But uh, in the meantime... We're going to miss you, but we hope you keep listening to us, if nothing else. I always do. Yes. And I love uh, we'll try to bring up a little smile to your face now and then and do what we can to cheer you up and keep your spirits up as we talk some Doctor Who and um, or Torchwood or whatever. And uh, just just know that, you know, we're here whenever you need us. OK. All right. Thank you, my friend. All right. Lori, I hope you had a good time. I didn't mean to get all I mushy did. on you there at the end, but I hope you had a good time. <laughs> did it, what, I had a fun time, a great did, time. Thank did you, you, guys. Did you get past your anxiety a little bit? A little bit? Well, Lori, you did great. <laughs> you did a fantastic job. Uh, and I'm job. not just saying that because I adore you. Yeah. The truth is you did uh-huh. really well. You were great. You're welcome anytime. Exactly. I know, and, and I will make a promise to you right now. Come hell or high water, if you say, hey, I want to do another episode, I'm right there with you. To, you Charles and I will hold your hand and do that because I would love to have you back on the show. Totally. Yeah. Did you say you haven't done silence in the library yet? Uh, yes. 
we can talk about that later if you want. Okay. Good. All right. That, All right. On that ominous note. My second favorite episode. All right. <laughs> so on that note, well, I'm glad you had a good time. Uh, next time on Next Stop Everywhere, episode 235, as we're going to discuss Black Orchid. So, yes, that very story that Lori mentioned way, way back at the beginning of this episode, you know, like five years ago when we started this episode. <laughs> um, so we're going to actually talk about that in a very interesting coincidence. And joining us for that is none other than Holly Mack making her return to Next Stop Everywhere. Yay! So, Holly, you know... Um, you know, we we just had her on not too long ago, but she was very eager about talking about this story. And uh, she's going to be our first one as we start this summer schedule. So uh, I hope everybody tunes in because I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Obviously, I'm going to be very enthused because this is a Davison story, Peter Davison story. It's only a two-parter. So even Jesse might like this one because it's only 45 <laughs> minutes total. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it features some fabulous costumes because there is a costume party in this episode. It's set in the 1920s and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about. It's one that I think is a very underrated, underappreciated story. And Holly kind of agrees with me on this one. So, so I think it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about. Watch for the dress. Exactly. Right. So let's see if I can get Lori to watch the episode now. We'll see. We'll see. But Jesse, I want to thank you for coming back and, and sharing your story and giving everybody an update. Hopefully it won't be too long before we talk to you again here at Next Stop Everywhere. Lori, thank you again. Hope you had fun. I and, did. All right. And uh, hopefully this won't be the last time we get you on the podcast. And everybody else, please come back next time. Black Orchid with Holly Mack, yours truly, and a whole lot of fun right here on Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.